Category O, Lecture 3, Block Decomposition. Let's start from our setup. We consider G a semi-simple finite dimensional complex Lie algebra with a fixed triangular decomposition G is equal to N minus plus H plus N plus, where H is a Cartan subalgebra. This leads to a root system of G and we choose some basis in this root system, which decomposes it into a disjoint union of positive and negative roots. So n plus is the direct sum of root subspaces for positive roots, and n minus is the direct sum of all root subspaces for negative roots. For a fixed weight lambda, we can consider the one-dimensional simple H module C lambda, on which an element H in H acts via the scalar prescribed by lambda, that is by lambda evaluated at h. We can further define that n plus kills c lambda, and in this way we define on c lambda the structure of a module over the Borel subalgebra h plus n plus of g. The Verma module delta of lambda is defined as the module induced from this one-dimensional module over the Borel subalgebra to the whole of G using the usual tensor induction. We know that each Verma module has a unique maximal submodule, and we denote by L lambda the corresponding unique simple quotient. So this is the unique simple highest weight module with highest weight lambda. Being a simple module, we know from Schur's lemma that it admits a central character, that is, each element of the center of the universal enveloping algebra acts on L lambda via a scalar, which is prescribed by the algebra homomorphism, which we denote by K lambda, from the center of the universal enveloping algebra to complex numbers. And the main question for today is for which weights lambda and mu, the corresponding central characters chi lambda and chi mu are equal. Let us start with defining the dot action of the while group. The while group, being the while group of a root system in H star, acts naturally on H star with the usual notation that W acts on lambda as W of lambda. Denote by rho, the element of H star given by the half of the sum of all positive roots. And define the dot action of W on H star as the usual action but shifted with respect to this element rho. So W dot lambda is defined as the usual action of W at the element of lambda plus rho minus rho. So this is an affine action, which is obtained from the original linear action by shifting the origin from zero to the point minus rho. For example, if the algebra G is SL2, then the while group is the symmetric group on two elements. It consists of the identity and one elementary transposition S. The Cartan subalgebra is one dimensional, and the root system consists of plus and minus 2. So the positive root is a root 2, and hence the element rho is the one half of 2, which is 1. The transposition S acts on the space H star by changing the sign. It sends a positive root 2 to the negative root minus 2. And so we can compute the dot action S dot lambda is equal to S of lambda plus 1 minus 1, which is minus lambda plus 1 minus 1, which is equal to minus lambda minus 2. And we can now compare this to what we already saw in the SL2 theory, that for a non-negative integer n, the Verma module delta n of SL2 has a submodule which is isomorphic to the Verma module delta minus n minus 2. So in other words, we have that the Verma module delta n has a submodule isomorphic to delta s dot 
n. We will see some versions of this later for more complicated Lie algebras. The element rho has an interesting property. For a positive root alpha, let us denote by f alpha, h alpha, and e alpha the SL2 triple corresponding to alpha. The claim is that the evaluation of rho at the element h alpha is equal to 1 for each simple root alpha. Note that the image of rho under the reflection S alpha is equal by definition of the reflection as rho minus a scalar multiple of alpha, where the scalar is given by evaluating rho at h alpha. So in order to prove our lemma, we simply need to prove that the image of rho under S alpha is equal to rho minus alpha. Recall that the image of alpha under S alpha is of course minus alpha, and also that S alpha permutes all positive roots except for alpha. So here it is important that alpha is a simple root. This is not true for just positive roots. But for, for a simple root alpha, it is true that the corresponding reflection maps alpha to minus alpha and permutes all other positive roots. So now we can compute the image of rho under the reflection as alpha. So we write rho as one half of alpha plus one half of the sum of all other positive roots. So as alpha sends alpha to minus alpha, so we just change the sign of the first summand. And then as alpha permutes all other positive roots, which means that the second summand remains the same. And now we readily see that the outcome is exactly rho minus alpha. So this proves this property of rho. So now we can use this to define some elementary homomorphisms between Verma modules. For a weight lambda, we denote by V lambda the canonical generator of delta of lambda. So this is defined uniquely up to a non-zero scalar. Proposition. For any weight lambda and any simple root alpha with the property that lambda of h alpha is a non-negative integer, there is a non-zero homomorphism from the Verma module delta as alpha dot lambda to the Verma module delta of lambda, which is given by sending the canonical generator of the first Verma module to the canonical generator of the second Verma module times the power of f alpha, and the exponent is lambda of h of alpha plus one. And we know that we already know from the SL2 theory that this claim is true for the Lie algebra SL2. We start the proof with the following observation. We know that our vector f alpha to the power lambda of h alpha plus one applied to v lambda is a weight vector of weight lambda, this is a weight of v lambda, minus, this is because f alpha corresponds to the root minus alpha, so minus the scalar multiple of alpha with a scalar given by our exponent. Now we can rewrite the one in this exponent as rho of h alpha using the lemma on the previous slide. And now this expression, we now easily see that this expression is exactly the image of lambda under the dot action of S alpha. So this element is a weight vector of weight S alpha dot lambda. That is the correct weight. This is exactly the highest weight of the first Verma module. If we have a simple root different from alpha, then the element E beta, which corresponds to this simple root, commutes with the element f alpha, simply because beta minus alpha is not a root. Therefore, if we apply e beta to our complicated element, we can move e beta past f alpha, and then directly act by e beta on v lambda, obtaining zero, because v lambda is the highest weight vector. On the other hand, if we take the simple root alpha, then the fact that E alpha kills our vector follows directly 
from the theory of Fermat modules for the corresponding SL2 subalgebra, which corresponds to the simple root alpha. So this is exactly the other highest weight of a Verma module under this condition on the highest weight of this module. In other words, all root vectors for simple roots kill our complicated vector. Since n plus is generated by root vectors of simple roots, it follows that n plus kills our vector. In particular, this is a weight vector killed by n plus. And since its highest weight is the same as the highest weight of our Verma module delta s alpha dot lambda, we can use the universal property of Verma modules and claim that there is a non-zero homomorphism from this Verma module to delta of lambda, which sent the canonical generator to our vector. So this completes the proof of the proposition. Now let us talk about the centralizer of the Cartan subalgebra in U of G. So let us denote by UG0 the set of all elements in U of G which commute with all elements of the Cartan subalgebra. Since taking the bracket with H is a derivation, it satisfies the Leibniz rule, it follows that UG0 is actually an associative subalgebra of U of G. And of course, it contains the unit element, so it's an associative and unital subalgebra of U of G. Consider the subspace I of U of G0 consisting of all elements of U of G0, which have the following form. So they belong to the space U of G times N plus. They can be written such that something from N plus is on the right. We claim that the same space can be written as a set of elements in UG0, which belong to n minus time U of G, and that it follows that I is actually a two-sided ideal of our algebra UG0. Moreover, we have that UG0 as a vector space decomposes into a direct sum of I and the universal enveloping algebra of H. To prove this lemma, Let's fix some order on the set of simple roots, alpha 1 up to alpha n, and some ordering of the set of positive roots, beta 1 up to beta k. Consider the poincare birgoff basis of the universal enveloping algebra given by binomials of the following form. We first write powers of root elements from n minus in the order of our positive roots, then powers of Cartan elements and then powers of root elements in n plus. Now, such a monomial belongs to the centralizer of the Cartan subalgebra if and only if the linear combination of positive roots with coefficients prescribed by the exponents of the corresponding f's equals to the linear combination of positive roots with coefficients prescribed by the exponents of the corresponding e's. This is because this element commutes with Cartan if and only if the weight of the n minus monomial is equal to, to minus the weight of n plus monomials. They should compensate each other to give the zero weight of the Cartan. So such a monomial is in UG0 if we have this equality. But in particular, this means that for such a monomial, some element Zi is non-zero, if and only if some element xj is non-zero. This means exactly that such a monomial belongs to ug n plus, if and only if it belongs to n minus ug. So this proves that our set i can be written in two different ways, and the fact that it can be written in two different ways immediately implies that it's a two-sided ideal of UG0, because here we can multiply on the left and here we can multiply on the right. Furthermore, the remaining monomials in UG0 are those where we only can use the Cartan elements, which proves this decomposition. So this completes the proof of our lemma.
We can now use this lemma to define what is known as the Harish Chandra homomorphism. The Harish Chandra homomorphism is the projection from the centralizer of the Cartan to the universe enveloping algebra of the Cartan with kernel i. So this is well defined due to the previous slide. And of course, since i is a two sided ideal, it follows that phi is a homomorphism of associative algebras. Now let us observe that u of h can be interpreted as the algebra of polynomial functions on h star. This is because h is finite dimensional and hence can be canonically identified with the dual space to h star. In particular, we can evaluate the elements of u of h at the elements of h star. We also remark that the center of the universe enveloping algebra belongs to the centralizer of the Cartan, because it commutes with everything, in particular with the Cartan. Now we claim that for any weight lambda and for any element z in the center of the universe enveloping algebra, the, this element z acts on the Verma module delta of lambda as the scalar, which is obtained by evaluating the polynomial function phi of, the, of z at the element lambda. So let's discuss the proof. So since the element z is an element of the centralizer of the Cartan subalgebra, when we apply it to the canonical generator of the Verma module, v lambda, uh, we will obtain some element of weight lambda. But this weight space in delta lambda is one dimensional and spent by v lambda, so we will get a scalar multiple of v lambda, and we can denote by chi lambda of z the corresponding scalar. So this is just a complex number. But in particular, this implies that our element z acts as this scalar on the corresponding weight subspace. Since this weight subspace generates the whole of the module, z acts as the scalar on the whole Verma module delta of lambda. So now let us write z as x plus y, where x is a polynomial in H and y is an element in our ideal. Since y belongs to the space u of g times n plus, it kills v lambda because v lambda is the highest weight vector and it is killed by n plus. Therefore, applying z to v lambda, we get exactly x times v lambda because y kills v lambda. And x is exactly the image of z under phi, so it's phi of z times v lambda. And since v lambda is a weight element and phi of z is a polynomial in Cartan, this polynomial acts on vz exactly by the scalar obtained by evaluating our polynomial at the weight lambda. So this completes the proof of our proposition. Let's consider the SL2 example. In the case of SL2, we have the Casimir element, C, which is equal to h plus 1 squared plus 4fe, and the center of SL2 is the polynomial algebra in this element. The centralizer of the Cartan subalgebra is the polynomial algebra in this element C together with the Cartan generator H. In fact, this is the only case uh, out of all simple Lie algebras where the centralizer of the Cartan subalgebra is commutative, which in particular in explains why all simple highest weight SL2 modules are pointed, that is, have at most one dimensional weight spaces. In any case, the image of C under the Harish Chandra homomorphism is h plus 1 squared. The homomorphism phi kills 4fe because it starts on the right with e. And so C acts on the Verma module delta lambda as a scalar lambda of h plus 1 to the power 2. So now we can formulate the main theorem of this lecture, which is Harish Chandra theorem. So this is a theorem by Harish Chandra from 1951. And it asserts that the restriction of the homomorphism phi to the center of the universe enveloping algebra is an isomorphism from the center to the algebra of polynomials in C of H, which are invariant 
under the dot action of W. So we will here discuss the easy part of the proof, and this is a part that the image of phi, when restricted to the center, belongs to this algebra of invariant polynomials. So the complete proof of this theorem is quite long, and we refer to Dick Smith's book for the complete argument. But to prove this part, let us consider an element z in the center, a simple root alpha, and a weight lambda such that the evaluation of lambda at h alpha is a non-negative integer. From the previous slides, we know that in this situation, we have a non-zero homomorphism from the Verma module delta s alpha dot lambda to the Verma module delta of lambda. But in particular, this means that the element z must act by the same scalar on both of these Verma modules. And we already saw that the scalar of z acting on a Verma module delta of mu is computed via the evaluation of the corresponding polynomial function of the image of z under the Harishian dra homomorphism at the element mu in h star. Also, let's note that the set of all lambda, which satisfy this condition that the evaluation of lambda of h at h alpha is a non-negative integer, is the risky dense in h star. Combining these together, we obtain that the polynomial function, which corresponds uh, to the image of z under the Harishian dra homomorphism, is invariant under the action of S alpha. And since W is generated by all S alpha, we get that this function is invariant under the dot action of the whole W. So this proves the easy part of the theorem, and for the rest of the proof, we refer to Dick Smith's book. Now let us discuss central characters of Verma modules. For a weight lambda, we denote by chi lambda the central character of the Verma module delta of lambda. This is an algebra homomorphism from the center of the universal enveloping algebra to complex numbers, which prescribes for each central element the scalar with which this element acts on the Verma module. And of course, the simple quotient of this Verma module has exactly the same central character. Now we claim that for two weights lambda and mu, the corresponding central characters coincide if and only if lambda belongs to the W orbit of mu with respect to the dot action. Proof. Let's start with the if statement. Assume that we can write lambda as W dot mu, where W is some element in the while group. Then for the central element Z, the scalar with which this element acts on delta lambda is the evaluation of phi of z at lambda. Since we know that phi of z is w dot invariant, this evaluation equals to evaluation of phi of z at the element mu, because they belong to the same w dot orbit. And this coincides with the scalar with which z acts on the module delta mu. So this proves the if part. For the only if part, assumes that lambda and mu belong to the different orbits. Then we have two finite and disjoint sets, so we can take a polynomial function, which is identically one on one of the orbits and identically zero on the other orbit. Applying the usual symmetrizer in the group with respect to the dot action, we can even assume that our function is symmetric with respect to the dot action of W. But then we can take its pre-image under the Harishian dra isomorphism, and then we see that this pre-image acts as one on one of the orbits, so on the Verma modules in one of the orbits, and as zero on the Verma module in the other orbit. So this means that it acts as one on the Verma module for lambda and as zero on the Verma module for mu. Therefore, these two modules have different central characters. So this proves the only if part. Now let us discuss weight spaces in modules in category O. Proposition, for each module in O, there is a finite set 
of weights such that the support of this module belongs to the union of supports of Verma modules with highest weights in this finite set. So to prove this, we first note that since M is a weight and finitely generated module, without loss of generality, we may assume that it is generated by one weight element. We use the poincare bergoff witt theorem to write our universal enveloping algebra as a product of u of n minus, u of n plus, and u of h. When acting on our generator by u of h, we just get the scalar multiple of this generator because it's a weight vector. By acting on our generator by u of n plus, we get a finite dimensional weight space. This is because the action of u n plus on all modules in O is locally finite. So we can take as lambda the support of this finite dimensional vector space, which is a finite set because the vector space is finite dimensional. What remains is the action of u n minus. And here we can note that if we consider u n minus as the adjoint module for the Cartan subalgebra, the set of weights of this module will be exactly the set of all elements, which can be obtained as a linear combination of negative roots with non-negative integer coefficients. Therefore, the support of our module M will belong to the union of the sets obtained by taking a weight from lambda and then adding a linear combination of negative roots with no negative integer coefficients, which is exactly the claim of the proposition. But from the proof of this proposition, we have the following corollary, namely that all weight spaces of any module in O are finite dimensional. Indeed, this follows directly from the proof because we can also note that all weight spaces of U and minus considered as the module, the adjoint module over the Cartan subalgebra, are finite dimensional. So U n minus is isomorphic to a Verma module as a vector space, and the Verma module is a module with finite dimensional weight spaces. The dimensions are given by Costan's partition function. We saw that in the previous lecture. Therefore, from this proof, it follows that each module in M has finite dimensional weight spaces. This is very important because this has the following corollary. It follows that the action of the center on any module in O is locally finite. Indeed, this action, of course, must preserve the weight spaces because the center commutes with the Cartan subalgebra. It should commute with the action of the Cartan subalgebra. So now, for any module M in O, and for any central character chi, we can denote by M of chi the set of all elements V in M, on which each central element Z acts with generalized eigenvalue given by chi of Z. This means that for each element Z in the center of the universe enveloping algebra, there is a positive integer k, such that the k's power of Z minus chi of Z kills V. And then from the linear algebra, we have the decomposition that M decomposes into a direct sum of M of chi's over all central characters chi. And also, since this is a decomposition with respect to the action of the center, each M of chi is a submodule of M. So now we can define the full subcategory O chi of O as the full subcategory consisting of all modules which coincide with their chi's component. And from the previous decomposition, we have the central character decomposition of O, so we can write O as a direct sum of all these subcategories of O chi. Clearly, there are no homes between different such subcategories and there are no x between them because this is a decomposition given by the action of the center. However, a small warning, we don't claim that O chi is indecomposable as a category. As we will see, these O chi's can sometimes be further decomposable. So what kind of consequences can we derive from this decomposition? First of all, every subcategory O chi 
has only finitely many simple objects up to isomorphism. Of course, we know that uh, there are only finitely many simple highest weight modules with the same central character. The number of these simple modules is at most the cardinality of the Weyl group. Also, let us recall that any central character of the universal enveloping algebra can be realized as a central character of some Verma module. So for the proof, uh, we refer to Dix Mia's book, but the rough idea is that because of the Harish-Chandra theorem, we can view the polynomial algebra in Cartan as a Galois extension of the algebra of W dot invariance, and therefore any character of the W dot invariance, which is roughly the same as a central character of uh, U of G due to the Harish-Chandra theorem, it extends to the character of the Cartan subalgebra. So this is what is behind the possibility of realization of central characters using Verma modules. Another corollary is that every module in O has finite lengths. Of course, it is enough to prove the statement for modules in O chi, and in O chi we have finitely many simples, and the module M has finite dimensional weight spaces. So the multiplicity of the simple highest weight module L lambda in the module M is obviously bounded by the dimension of the weight space M lambda. This is because L lambda lambda is one dimension. So let's consider the SL2 example. So in the two SL2 example, we have one dimensional Cartan and one dimensional dual space. The while group with two elements, which acts on H star by changing the sign. And we also saw that the row is equal to one. So we know that the central characters for the weights lambda and minus lambda minus two are the same but the orbit of W can only contain these two weights, so there is nothing else. So this gives us two possibilities. First of all, we have the degenerate case of lambda equal to minus one. In this case, lambda is equal to minus lambda minus two. So the category O chi minus one has exactly one simple module, namely the simple highest weight module L minus one. In all other cases, the category O chi lambda has two simple modules, namely L lambda and L minus lambda minus two. But here again, we have two cases. We have the integral case. This is when lambda is a non-negative integer. And then O chi lambda has the simple modules L lambda and L minus lambda minus two and they both are subquotients of the Verma module delta lambda. But this one is indecomposable, which means that the category O chi lambda is indecomposable in this case. And then we also have the non-integral case. In this case, the category O chi lambda is further decomposable. This is because the module L lambda has support, which belongs to the coset lambda plus Z alpha, so alpha is root two. And the highest weight module L minus lambda minus two has support which belongs to the coset minus lambda plus Z alpha. And these two cosets are disjoint. So this means that there are no homes, there are no X between these modules. And so the category splits into a direct sum of two categories, each having one simple module, this one, and this one. So this suggests that we should talk about integral blocks. Recall that a weight is called integral if its evaluation at all h alpha, where alpha is a simple root, is an integer. Claim, if, if lambda is an integral weight, then the corresponding block O chi lambda is indecomposable. To see this, we know that if alpha is a simple root, such that as alpha dot lambda is strictly less than lambda, then we saw already on the previous slides that L as alpha dot lambda is a subquotient of the Verma module delta of lambda. This is because we established that there is, under these assumptions, there is a non-zero homomorphism from delta as alpha dot lambda to delta of lambda. 
And of course, delta of lambda is indecomposable, which means that L of lambda, so delta of lambda is indecomposable and also has L lambda as a subquotient, which means that L as alpha dot lambda and L lambda must belong to the same indecomposable sum and of O. But in the integral case, W is generated by simple reflections. So using the same trick, we can connect all elements in the orbit and deduce that they belong to the same block of category O. This means that all chi lambda is indecomposable as category. To describe indecomposable blocks of O in the general case, we need to introduce the notion of an integral while group. For a weight lambda, the integral while group W lambda of lambda is a subgroup of W generated by all reflections, not necessarily simple reflections, but all reflections S alpha, such that the evaluation of lambda at H alpha is an integer. So a, a trivial example for SL2, we can only have W lambda uh, is equal to the whole while group. This is if you have an integral block or W lambda can be the identity. This is when we have the weight lambda is not an integral weight. Also remark that W lambda doesn't have to be generated by simple reflections. So it is not a parabolic subgroup of W in general. However, it is the while group of some root subsystems of phi. And the claim is that the indecomposable block of O containing L lambda, where lambda is a weight, is exactly the SER subcategory of O generated by all simple highest weight modules, which belong to the dot orbit of lambda with respect to the integral while group W of lambda. So why this is the case, we will understand in the next lecture when we will discuss the BGG theorem about the structure of Verma modules. So it will be formulated, there will be the structure theorem where arbitrary reflections with respect to all roots will play an essential role. And we will see that using such reflections, we can get submodules of Verma modules, which provides us with the arguments for indecomposability of such blocks. Okay, as usually, we finish with a couple of questions for PhD students. Problem number one, prove that the dot stabilizer of the zero weight in H star is trivial. Note that the zero weight is, of course, has the full stabilizer for the usual action, but the uh, dot action is designed so that the, orbit, the dot orbit of zero is a regular orbit. Question number two, is the associative algebra UG0 finitely generated as an algebra? Question number three, show that uh, the dimension of the home space between any pair of modules in O is finite. Question number two, assume that we are given two modules in O such that their supports are disjoint. Prove in this case that the home space between them is zero. Question, can one deduce that the first x between these modules in O is also zero? And finally, question number five. So assume that we have two modules M and N in O, such that the support of M plus integral combinations of all roots is disjoint from the support of N plus integral combinations of all roots. Show that the first x between two such modules is zero. Thank you. See you next time.